Today we'll explore the fluid mosaic model of cell membranes. So what does the fluid mosaic model even mean? First off, we should clarify where exactly the cell membrane even is. The cell membrane is the outer surface or protective layer of the cell which separates the cell from its external environment. So in a fluid mosaic model, we're looking at the membrane through a cross section of its surface. So underneath the membrane would be the interior of the cell, also known as the cytoplasm, while the above the membrane would be the external environment. So this model allows us to take a closer look at what a cellular membrane is made of and what properties it has. So the cell membrane is normally made of a phospholipid bilayer, as we see on the screen. So when you hear that for the first time, it will probably sound very confusing. So what is a phospholipid in the first place? This is a good question because once we understand what it actually is, it'll make a lot of sense as to why it forms this bilayer and why it's the basis for so many membranes in biological systems. So on the screen now is an image of a phospholipid. As its name implies, this is a lipid that involves a phosphate group. There's a whole video on lipids on this channel, but as a brief review, a lipid generally means something that does not dissolve in water very well. And this is once again true in the case of this phospholipid. We have these hydrocarbon tails that come from fatty acids, and so these tails don't have any obvious charge or polarity. We know that water is a polar molecule, which is what gives its hydrogen bonds and its attraction to itself. But the hydrocarbon tails don't have any of those features, and so as a result, the tails are not attracted to the water, and the water is not attracted to the tails either. So we have a term for biomolecules such as hydrocarbons, which is that they are hydrophobic. However, it's only the hydrocarbons of the phospholipid that are hydrophobic. This word basically means afraid of water. The phosphate head of the molecule has a different property. As we quickly see when we look at the phosphate head, there is some charge, unlike the hydrocarbons. We also know that charged molecules do well and dissolve in polar substances such as water. So the term we have for molecules like phosphate is that they are hydrophilic, and this means water-loving. So this is quite strange at first glance. We have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail to this molecule. So there are both hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts to this molecule. There's actually a special term for molecules like these ones, and it is that phospholipids are amphipathic. So this hydrophobic and philic combination in the molecule might start to hint at why the phospholipids are oriented in the way that they are in bilayer membranes. Now you could predict that the hydrophilic phosphate heads are going to want to be where the water is, which is probably going to be in the watery cytoplasm or the aqueous external environment. As a result, the heads will face towards the inside and outside of the membrane, as we can see in the images. On the other hand, the hydrophobic hydrocarbon tails are going to want to be as far away from these watery environments as possible. To do this, it huddles in the middle of the cell membrane so that it is away from both the inside and the outside of the membrane. So as the tails stay in the middle and the heads face the edges, the thousands of phospholipids arrange into this bilayer formation so that both heads are comfortable and correspond with each other. So this is a very interesting concept to think about. You could actually imagine that billions of years ago, even before cellular life formed, phospholipids would probably arrange into these spherical lipid bilayers simply with the intent to fulfill the amphipathic molecule's tendencies. So this might have been the baseline protocells that eventually bonded with organelles and genomes and their own complex evolutions, and that this was quite possibly one of the steps that began the creation of cellular life. So we're able to create this phospholipid bilayer by virtue of the amphipathic properties of these molecules. However, the cell membrane is not made of just phospholipids. As we can see in the images, there are tons of tiny additional structures that are within this membrane. A lot of these substructures are actually proteins and carbohydrates that are wedged into the membrane. So this just goes to show the diversity and complexity that is on or embedded into the cell membrane and that absolutely nothing in a cell is plain and simple. So we should no longer think of the cellular membrane as just this uniform bilayer and more of this diverse and busy edge of the cell. A metaphor you could use to think of the cell membrane is border patrol. The membrane is like the border to the cell and checks what gets in and out of the cell. This is called a semi-permeable membrane and it selectively allows things to pass to and from the cell. 
So going back to the things inside of the membrane itself, we have these proteins, but there are a variety of proteins embedded here. The proteins that go all the way across the membrane from one end to the other are known as transmembrane proteins, which are a special class of integral proteins. The smaller proteins may only interact with one end of the bilayer, unlike the transmembrane proteins, which interact with both. We also have these tiny strands coming off the membrane, which are glycolipids. This is actually a fastened one because it has this lipid end which lodges itself in the center of the membrane along with the hydrocarbons since it's hydrophobic. But it also has this other end that is really just a chain of sugars. And this part is going to be hydrophilic and poke out towards the external environment. The main purpose of the glycolipids is actually for cell-to-cell -cell recognition. It's sort of like an identification method for cells. For example, us humans use fingerprints or ID cards for methods of recognition. The same is for cells, but they use the glycolipids. So your immune system will use these glycolipids to differentiate between which cells are the ones that are actually from your body and supposed to be there, and the cells that are foreign, in which case the immune system may want to eliminate them from the body. When people talk about blood type, they're basically talking about what type of glycolipids you have on your blood cells and other parts of the body. This is why if you donate blood, your blood type might be compatible with many other blood types, such as O negative, while some others may only be compatible with a select number of blood types. So in general, glycolipids are a way for cells to recognize each other. It's very fascinating how these chains of sugars can lead to such fundamental compatibilities and behaviors. So not only do we have sugar chains on lipids, but we also have sugar chains on proteins. And these are known as glycoproteins. We also have things like cholesterol embedded into the cell membrane as well. Since cholesterol is a lipid, it's going to sit in between the two edges of the membrane, along with the hydrocarbon chains and all the other hydrophobic substances. The main purpose of the cholesterol is to maintain a stable fluidity of the membrane, so making sure it's not too fluid or too stiff. So we now understand the mosaic of things that make the cellular membrane, but what about the fluid part? As I just talked about, the cholesterol maintains the fluidity. And that what's interesting about that is that this is not a rigid structure. If one of the proteins were to be jostled around a little bit so that it would slip out of the membrane, the phospholipids would just spontaneously rearrange to fill in the gap. You can imagine all the proteins and glycolipids are all flowing around and that the membrane actually has a consistency that of oil or salad dressing. So it's not a rubbery texture like the outside of a balloon, but actually more like a semi-fluid that is just strong enough to separate the cell from its external environments, which is where the name fluid mosaic model comes from. So this was definitely a video with a lot of new information and knowledge, which will all come to use in the future. This all pretty much gives you the perspective that you need to understand that the expectation and reality of cells, and really all of science in general, are very different. So in the next video, we'll begin to look at the organelles inside of the cytoplasm of the cell and how they come to be, which will also be a lot of new information, which is all really interesting and fascinating to learn and get a grasp of. But for now, I thank you all for watching.